Gentlemen, welcome back to the T. Shanley starting a business, building a brand vlog. This one, big number 294. So today we are talking about something that I think every entrepreneur in the back of their head, even if they don't admit it, like, yeah, I want to sell my bit. Like, I think every entrepreneur that starts a business at some point has dreams of selling it, right? Selling it for like millions and millions of dollars to a bigger company that's going to take your baby and then grow it bigger, stronger, and sexier, right? There's a question that was asked in last week's vlog. He says, it's from our friend Ivo B. He says, what would you do if someone wants to buy one of your businesses, in parentheses, maybe Pete and Pedro, for about $15 million? Would you sell that company? So this is a question that really actually got me thinking. <laughs> and I wanna talk a little bit about the thought process and what you may be faced with if someday somebody does actually come to you and, and offer to buy your business, because there's a number, right? I think everybody's got like that number. But when you hear this idea of like, whoa, $15 million, of course, like here are the keys, right? There's a lot more that goes into it and things that you've got to consider and look at. And so just let me get this out of the way. Nobody has offered me $15 million for Pete and Pedro. But when I saw this question, I started really thinking about it. I'm like, all right, would I do it? Because, you know, part of you thinks no, but then part of you is like, damn, 50 million bucks. Like, okay, so, so let's talk about this because I think it's an incredible question and it's something that has definitely gotten my gears sort of churning. You know, certain businesses like T. Shanley, we would not sell for $15 million. Like, no, we wouldn't do that. Stubble Buddy, you betcha. <laughs> Enemy, yep, here are the keys, right? Um, I would definitely sell those businesses for $15 million. But Pete and Pedro is like an interesting one, right? Like we are not doing $15 million in revenue, but we're doing a lot of revenue, millions and millions of dollars of revenue, right? And so when you think about and try to determine, all right, what is that number for selling your business? There are a lot of different things you gotta think of, all right? And in terms of valuation, right? Valuation is one of the things that is, is, is challenging because every entrepreneur thinks their business is more valuable than it actually is. Like everybody, every single person thinks that their business is, is bigger than it is. Like just the other day, and this is actually yesterday, um, Antonio and I were on a call. We have that company, like we, I, I mentioned before, Area 627, where we invest in uh, companies that wanna bootstrap it and grow their business. We are not investing in companies that are, that are building their business to sell it and exit it. We want companies that are kind of like in it for the long term. Um, we did actually find our first, our first company that we have officially, actually not officially, we're still working through all the paperwork, invested in. Super excited about that. But yesterday, he and I are talking to the, these, these two amazingly smart women about their, their business, it's a makeup business. And in the past year, they've done like, I think like $130,000. Okay, great, congratulations, that's awesome. Or that's awesome. And so we said, well, what do you think your business is worth? And she goes, $5 million. <laughs> I go, oh, okay. So that's not reality, right? But this brings up a great question. How do you really determine a value? And there are so many different ways to calculate value of a business. You know, they do multiples of profit. They do multiples of gross sales. They do, you know, EBITDA times X, Y, Z. And so it's all over the board. You know, also, is it a subscription or is it a one-time purchase? You know, T. Shanley, is very valuable because not only are we doing a lot of a lot of sales but most of our sales are subscription so every month you're not starting at zero you're starting at x multiple of millions of dollars and so you know if there's a company that wants to come in and basically acquire T Shanley and already has other products they could basically leverage our client base and so that becomes a lot a lot more valuable you know dollar shave club sold for I think it was a billion dollars back in the day because they had all of these subscribers and they weren't profitable, which is interesting, right? They weren't even profitable and they sold for a billion dollars. Um, and so when I think about valuation, you know, when I think about it, I think about, all right, so Pete and Pedro is also built differently than like a T. Shanley in terms of Pete and Pedro is a lifestyle business, right? I focus on profit, right? I want my profit margin to be as high as possible but still be able to grow. T. Shanley, a little bit different. We still don't want to waste money, but we are more on the fast growth trajectory, thinking that someday, you know, somebody like a Unilever could potentially come in and want to acquire T. for, you know, $100 million, $200 million, like whatever that is. If I'm being honest, that's kind of like the target in our heads. 
Pete and Pedro is different. <laughs> you know, I run Pete and Pedro at about you know, 25 to 30% profit margin, which is good, right? But when you think about this, and we're just gonna throw numbers out there, right? Okay, so say for instance, Pete and Pedro is doing $10 million a year. You think, okay, $10 million a year. What is the profit margin on that? Now, if the profit margin is like zero, or say, I don't know, say it was a million dollars, right? And somebody comes to you and says, hey, I wanna buy your business for $15 million, okay. Do you sell it? Well, I don't know. If you're doing and churning or pulling out a million dollars a year, how many years would it take you to make that $15 million? 15 years, right? But say you're at 20% profit margin. Say each year Pete and Pedro is generating $10 million. I'm pulling out $2 million cash in my pocket. How many years then? Seven and a half. All right, now, now, now let's, let's take it a little deeper. Let's go two and a, or 25%, all right? If it's making $10 million, my profit margin is 25%. I'm making two and a half million dollars a year, take home, not including like, we're not talking about taxes and income tax and everything like that. How many years, right? So, so, so the amount of years that it's going to take me to generate $15 million starts sliding down. The other thing that I think about is the people that work for me, right? All right, so say somebody offers me $15 million. All right, well, I have sort of in my head said, all right, Everybody that kind of works for my company that's been here for you know, X number of years, I want to be able to give them a million dollars. Like I want to give each person that works for me, if I'm selling it, if I'm like cashing out, I want to give you a million, like I want to give employees a million dollars. It's just something that I've always fantasized about doing. And because it's them, right? It's them that is, that is working super hard. But then I think, all right, well, you know, for most of them, you know, it would take many years to make a million dollars. But for, you know, some, like, it, there, it becomes a much more complex thing. And, um, and so, all right, so say I've got five employees. Say somebody offers me $15 million and I got five employees, $5 million, boom, coming off the top, I'm giving away. So now I'm left with $10 million. Remember, now if it's making you know, 2.5 million and I'm taking that home, it'll only take me four years to make $10 million, right? So do I do it? Now let's throw in the whole, you know, tax implications. Now the good news with selling your business is that it is taxed differently than regular income tax. If I'm making $2.5 million a year, and that is because the way, you know, that company is structured, it's a, an LLC, right? All of the income, all of the profit, I should say, flows to my taxes directly. Now in terms of tax brackets, I'm at a high tax bracket, right? I'm, you know, with, with state and federal, you know, Georgia, I think is 6%, federal, I'm right at around like, I think it's like, 46% tax. So basically, you know, 54 cents of every dollar that it generates, I'm paying, or that's how much I'm actually keeping. So if I were theoretically making $2.5 million after taxes, I'm looking at, just for easy math, let's call it 50%, so 1.25 million. So now you start thinking, okay, well, if somebody offers me 15 million, I give away five, I've got 10, how many years do I, does it take me to generate $10 million if I'm taking home or in my pocket 1.25 million, all right? But when you sell a business, now a lot of times it's capital gains. Capital gains tax is lower. I think the last time I checked or heard it was around 20 to 28%, somewhere in that 20 to 30 range. Now, Joe Biden is proposing to raise the long-term capital gains tax to like, I think it's like 43%, but then, it go like, but then there's another tax on top of that. So it would essentially be like 45% you're paying on long-term capital gains, which I think is a little, a little excessive, <laughs> a little. Anyway, so when you start really thinking about this, you know, and you, I should say, I start really thinking about this, you know, the answer would be no, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it for $15 million. Would I do it for 20? it gets a little more attractive. 30? Oh, you bet you I'd probably toss the keys. Now, I am not saying that I, that's how much money it's generating. I'm just giving you a real world example that's not like super far off. Because like I said, you know, these big numbers, you know, everybody, you know, tosses out these giant numbers. But when it really boils down to how much is your business worth and how long will it take you as the business owner to generate the amount of money that you're gonna be getting because when you sell it, your income from that business stops. Now, 
There are a lot of other nuances around somebody acquiring your business. Like Dollar Shave Club, I think they sold for a billion. At the time they sold, because they raised so much money, I think Mike, the founder, had like 8%. So call it $80 million. But he also was required to stay on as sort of like the lead for, I think, like two or three years. Now, I'm sure there were other you know, bonuses and perks and, and, and things associated with that. I assume I don't know the, that for a fact. Something else, I'm gonna, toss, I'm gonna toss something else at you. For me, in terms of selling a business, there's something else that comes along with that. And that is the right to whoever, for whoever buys it to my images, to my videos, to whatever collateral I have made that is dedicated for that specific business. And so, if I were to sell you know, Pete and Pedro, what they would also get is all of my images, all of the pictures, all of me talking about by Pete and Pedro that, that I've done, they then can leverage that and spend a bunch of money in getting that out there. So essentially, if I ever sell one of my businesses, it's like licensed to whore me out wherever. And so am I saying that there's a price for that? Yeah, there's probably a price for that. What's it worth? I don't know, but that's something else that I consider. You know, so there's a lot that goes into it, but I, I love these questions that really get me like thinking about things on a very like abstract level. And this question was such a great question. So $50 million, no. 20, like we're getting, we're getting warmer, but a uh, great question. And hopefully it's something that you will have to deal with or figure out at some point in your entrepreneurial journey. Because honestly, you know, I hear a lot of, I, I, I don't know many people, if I'm being honest, that have sold a business. I don't know even really what the transaction looks like or how it works. I don't know people that have done that. I know a few people, you know, Kelly knows a lot of people that have done that. Um, but it would definitely be excited. Now, something else you need to know, I have been contacted, Tish Hanley has been contacted a bunch from you know, private equity firms and people like, hey, do you wanna sell some of your equity and do you wanna raise money? You know, for Pete and Pedro, I've been contacted by people and it's like, nah, I'm cool. I don't need money. Like, I'm good. It's, 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 a, it's a profitable lifestyle business. T. Shanley does need money in order to grow. And so we are in the process now of considering our options in terms of raising money and what that actually looks like. Just keeping you up to speed because that is something that we, we've talked about because we are, we have figured out some growth things and some things that are actually helping us grow and for us to really grow at the rate and maintain the quality and the customer service and the integrity of our business, it will require us to have more access to cash. And so this is something that we've been discussing. In two weeks, I'm headed up to Chicago for the first official in-person meeting that we've had in like literally two years. And I'm super pumped and excited about that. And I cannot wait to bring you guys up and to see everybody there. It, it's great. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, anyway, it's crazy to think that there are people that work for T. Hanley that I have never physically shook their hand. Like Andrew, our CFO, I've never actually shaken his hand. I've never met him in person. Amanda, you know, I've never met her. There, there are a lot of people on the team that I've never met and I'm really excited about that. And so exciting times. Things are really looking good for T. Hanley. There are some things that I'll update you on next week that I think we've actually figured some stuff out. We also have kind of figured out that that I love you video that you guys have all saw with the redhead walking and the guy being like, what, right? It's working. It's working a lot. Anyway, I'll go into more detail about some of the growth successes that we've been having next time. I don't want to get into it right now. And like, it's, it's, it's a little premature because we're still learning. And in the next week, we'll have a lot more information. Um, but what I would like to do, there are a few business questions. If you guys have a business question, down below, start it with business question and ask your question. Next week, I'm going to, like I said, tell you, give you an update, T. Shanley, some exciting stuff. Give you an update, like I promised you about this vlog with the Stubble Buddy, uh, but I'm gonna save that till next week. The Stubble Buddy's actually had two like really big like press releases uh, written up by like a tech thing and then a, a, a website called The Awesomer featured it. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, things are good. But what I'd like to do is get to some of your business questions. So next week, update on Tej, on Stubble Buddy, but now your questions. But I would like to say, if you're interested in buying Pete and Pedro and you got 15 million large, I'm, 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 I'm open to talk.
First business question comes from our friend Lazaridis Jonathan. What's up, brother? Good to hear from you again. He says, I want to start a high quality watch company at an affordable price. You know, I love watches. I like, I like it already. A uh, similar concept with Enemy, but for men's watches. Enemy, super premium, but the price point, amazing. Ah, all right. Um, I believe a watch is an essential item for a man, and, it's, uh, and it automatically elevates his style and image, especially if it's a high quality one. And I've noticed you wearing an amazing watch in the vlogs. Yes, thank you. Um, I love watches. I've got expensive taste in watches. You want to hear something crazy? You want to hear, so you want to hear something crazy? All right, so this is, this is a, a watch. It, it's a... It's a Rolex, a gold one. I've got other Rolexes. The price of watches, Rolex watches specifically, have gone absolutely insane. Because A, you can't get them. Authorized dealers don't have them. Apparently Rolex like, like decided, to, yo, we're chilling with manufacturing. And I heard that it was because they had to, or they were trying to like squeeze out the gray market, places like Joma Shop. And so they, they, they squeezed everybody. But now what the, what's happening is a lot of people are paying a lot of money for a watch. Um, this watch is up like literally 40% from when I bought it. Um, steel watches also like crazy. The only thing that is not up is my Milgals. <laughs> Apparently nobody wants a Milgals. I love the Milgals, man. That thing is awesome. The lightning, but anyway, whatever. It's expensive to buy high-end watches, apparently. I don't know what's happening with like the other markets in terms of like Patex or any of these other like super premium, but uh, but man, Rolex, look out, mama. If you're if you're ever like want to see craziness, like go on to like Chrono 24. It's I like literally I lay in bed and just like look at watches. <laughs> I got a problem. I haven't bought one in a while though. All right, back to your question, Lazardus. This I'm sorry for <laughs> butchering your name and, and messing things up. All right. So what are some things that you look for in a high quality watch that make you want to buy it? Also, I was thinking of selling around 85 to 120. Does that price point sound realistic? Not for a high quality watch, no. For a fashion watch, yeah. And that's kind of the, the movement, Vincero, the fifth, like that is their game. So high quality is kind of, it, 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 it's, it depends on who you're talking to, right? There are some watches out there, like the Seikos, right? Seiko makes a super great watch. The price is good. It's really good. I mean, they're super affordable. Timex, like the, the Timex Weekender is one of my all-time favorite watches. And it's like 50 bucks. The quality is great. It lasts forever, you know? So quality is kind of relative. Now, in terms of, of for 85 to 120, what I know that you can do is you can do things like you can use a Myota movement, which is a high quality, like Japanese movement. That, that is within the specs of, I should say, within the margin of 120 to 150. Like if you look at like movements and Vinceros, like look at what they're doing. Over the years, I have seen literally movement, Vincero, I have seen the quality of their watches just really go higher, right? They've started investing more money in the quality of the leather and their straps, in the material of their case, the crystal, the movement. I mean, they've done a really good job like elevating the quality. Now they still get a terrible reputation um, in terms of people just don't like those watches, like fashion watches, but I personally think that they're, they're great watches. And the thing that I love about them is that they're a really cool look at a really affordable price. You know, now, can you find higher quality watches? You know, some would argue yes. You know, the Orients, high quality, low price. Seikos, some of the entry level Seikos, high quality, low price. Timex, high quality, low price. Then you start getting into that like next level, like 250 to 500, you know, your Hamiltons. Like there are, like, <laughs> I love watches. Um, and I love all watches. I love fashion watches. I love expensive watches. I like designer watches. But back to your question, I know I'm on a little bit of a tangent. You know, I think for the $85, $100, $20 price point, is that realistic? I don't know. I don't know if that's realistic or not. I think you need to figure out like, how are you advertising it? What is your margin going to be? Can you afford to not only make it, advertise that watch for, you know, and, and that customer acquisition cost, get it low enough that you're still making money? I don't know. And is it better, like last vlog, there was a question about, is it better to sell more of something at a lower margin or less of something at a higher margin? You know, you've got to just figure it out. But in terms of a high quality watch, I look for a nice movement. And if you want to be honest, you know, um, um, uh, mechanical movements like, like that actually take a battery are 
100% more accurate than a mechanical or automatic watch. A lot of people be like, no way, They're like, yes, they are. It's just the nature of what they are. Um, <laughs> I could talk about watches all day. Anyway, good luck. High quality for $125, maybe, but you gotta figure out your advertising. And that, back to that, back to movement, I personally think the movement story is an inspiring one. Two entrepreneurs, two young kids, start a company and sold it to Movado, a big company, for like 80, 90 million dollars, like good for you. And everybody else that's bitching and whining, shut up. And the last business question comes from our friend, Cart of El Guchin, 1992. Sorry for butchering that name, brother, but I'm glad you're here. What are your thoughts on starting your business solo and man maintaining full control versus getting partners and giving up some of the control with the business decisions? I think that it depends on your business. It depends. It depends on your business. It depends on your skill set, what you bring to the table, and it depends if there's somebody that can partner with you that basically does some of the heavy lifting for you or complements you in terms of your skill and your ability. All right, so Pete and Pedro, I own 100% of Pete and Pedro. In terms of T. Shanley, I do not own 100% of that. You've got Rob, you've got Kelly, and you've got the chemist, right? Each person brought a different skill set and a different thing to the table. And so, you know, and, and, and to this day, you know, each person kind of like has their roles, stays in their lane, and it has allowed T. Shanley to grow to where, where it is. You know, if T. Shanley was just a one-man show, it would not be where it is, period. Regardless of if I started it, Rob started it, Kelly started it, it wouldn't be where it is. You know, I think that business partners bring a ton of value in certain situations, but you do lose control to some, it, it depends. I mean, it depends on how you set it up. You know, Salon Posta, I have two partners in, in the salon aspect of that business. I got Steven, I got myself, and I got Tony. Each person brings a different skill set to the table. And so in that situation and scenario, it's great. You know, yeah, you do, you give up things, but you also gain things. And so really it's about figuring out what you and your business needs and is there a way to bring somebody on as your partner that shares your vision and, and you guys can grow it bigger together? And I guess that's kind of like the big thing that everybody talks about on like Shark Tank and everything. Do you want, you know, 100% of a, of a grape or 50% of a watermelon? Of course, everybody would say 50% of a watermelon because it's more, right? And so if there's somebody that compliments you, that helps or that can, that, can, that can do things that you're not good at, I think it might be a good opportunity. But that being said, you should not give away equity to somebody that you could just pay to do a job, like a developer. A lot of people fall into the, the trap of, I'm gonna give my developer 10%, 20%, when you should just pay them. Because long term, you know, people will be like, oh, I always am gonna need development. Yeah, and you can always pay for the development. But in terms of your business, I would say, if there's somebody that brings something intangible to your business that's gonna help it, bring them on. Maybe it's even money, maybe it's money. Maybe they're bringing the cash to the table. That's another thing, like you've just gotta decide what is gonna be best and right for you and your business. But like I said, if there's, if there's a service or a skill that you can outsource and pay, and even if you've gotta raise a little bit of money in order to do that, I say do that because it's better than actually giving that person or that entity money because when the job's done, a lot of times these people like hit the road and they don't do anything. And then you're just going to be pissed off <laughs> for the rest of the time that you're in the business. But great question. Guys, if you've got a business question down below, start it with business question and ask it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for rolling with us. And thanks for asking such amazing questions. It gets me thinking and I love it. And it really does get my entrepreneurial juices flowing. Guys, we love you more than our double monk trap shoes. Thanks for hanging with us and we'll see you next week.